Uh, hi, I'm John Sleesman. I'm uh, uh, Chief of the Division of Allergy Immunology and Pulmonary Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics, and it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Maureen Goodenow. Uh, Dr. Goodenow's career was forged in the laboratories of Frank Lilly at Einstein, where she was a molecular virologist. She went on to do a postdoc at, uh, at the Sloan Kettering Memorial in beautiful uh, Manhattan, and uh, where she's from and then spent some time at the Pasteur Institute with Simon Wayne Hobson and Fernando Plata, where she studied HIV-1 genetic variability. 1988, she moves to the best state ever. You guys don't read Dave Barry, do you? Um, where, the University of Florida, where she uh, was involved uh, in um, studying the uh, genetic variability of HIV transmission from mother to child, where she also encountered a brilliant young uh, clinician scientist uh, who uh, helped mold her career. That would be me. And uh, we were involved in the, uh, first the transmission of HIV from mother to child, because at that time in the state of Florida, AIDS was the fourth leading cause of death of children under the age of two. At one time I had nine children with pneumocystis carinii pneumonia in our intensive care unit. It was a horrendous situation. Uh, antiretroviral therapy was not available, and we were fortunate to be part of a study uh, with Phil Pizzo at the NCI, which was the first protease inhibitor trial in children, which revolutionized treatment of children uh, with AIDS and, uh, and started really the whole idea of using uh, heart therapy for, uh, for young children to prevent onset to AIDS. Uh, she had, during that period of time, multiple uh, postdocs and uh, graduate students some of whom are actually here in the room. Right, Wilton? Wave your hand. And uh, served on multiple um, NIH study sections, including the uh, AIDS Research Advisory Committee for, for NIH. For some reason in 2011, and I'm not really sure why, her career took a, a turn, and she received a prestigious Jefferson uh, a Fellowship uh, with the State Department and became involved in global health. Uh, she went back to Florida and then was called back to D.C. to be uh, with Ambassador Burks at, in the, um, the um, Office of, uh, of Global AIDS and uh, very involved in, in PEPFAR. And then for reasons that are completely unclear to me, she took this job, uh, where she is now the Associate Director for AIDS Research and the Director of the Office of, uh, of AIDS uh, at, at the NIH, a job that she's had since uh, July. So with no further ado, I will introduce Dr. Goodenow. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity of what I hope will be a conversation um, between me and my new role and you as um, key investigators in the, um, the AIDS portfolio that's being funded through the NIH and through, as I now understand even more detail, through my office at the NIH. Um, I wanted to let you know that this is the first presentation that I'm making in this new role and that Duke was way out in front of everyone else offering me this invitation and I am very grateful to that. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to see some people that I haven't seen in a while, in particular Colleen. It's really been a while since I sort of rotated out of the um, PACTG and IMPACT that I've had a chance to see you guys. Um, Wilton, I'm sorry to see you haven't taken over the, the whole university yet, but I think you have a few more years. Wilton was a graduate student in my group, and he was just fantastic. Um, and then, of course, my longstanding collaborator, John Sleesman. What John didn't tell you about when we first met at Florida was that I arrived about three weeks after he did, and, my ch and he was in pediatrics and I was in pathology, and my chair of pathology graciously offered to John my office. So when I arrived, I had no place <laughs> to go. <laughs> so, but it was the start of a good collaboration, as you, most of you um, who follow what we've done over the years know that it's... Um, it's been a long-standing collaboration, more years than prefer to admit, <laughs> but anyway. 
So as John mentioned too, I've been at the NIH now about 60 days. I sort of use that as my benchmark. Um, and so what have I learned? People want to know, what have I learned? What am I going to do? How am I changing the office? But I, so I haven't, I'm not going to tell you the, the second and third items, but I can tell you that I'm starting to learn my way around. I can get from where I live to the campus, from the campus to Fisher's Lane, where OAR is. Um, the campus itself, I can, I can find building one, fortunately, because I have an office there, and building two, and building 31, which is where a lot of the institute directors and um, center directors have their offices, and building 50, where my lab is moving from the University of Florida. So that's sort of the scope geographically of my life at the moment. Um, one of the things about, I guess I better move this a little bit. One of the things about being at the um, NIH is, is the fact that it has this amazing historical aspect to it. And so when you walk into the building that you see here, which is actually building one, there's this plaque to the side of the door that really commemorates the, um, um, uh, what do you call it, the dedication of this building and the first building on the NIH campus, the establishment of the NIH campus um, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1940. Um, and at that time, he talked about the National Institutes of Health speaking to the universal language of humanitarianism, that it's devoted to further the health of mankind, underlying philosophy of public health, and the wise use of vital resources of our nation. And so that's quite a, a testimony to the organization. Um, Currently, NIH, as you mostly know, has about 27 institutes and centers, or ICs, and each of these has a focus on a specific research agenda, often focusing on particular diseases or systems. NIH leadership plays an active role in shaping the agency's activities and outlook, and there's an annual public investment greater than $30 billion um, to the NIH. And I think in the last, in FY16, it was actually $32 billion. So within the NIH then, how did the Office of AIDS Research develop? And as John indicated, you know, early when we were finishing our training, it was really the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And so actually, it was in 1983 um, that the first legislation was passed that started to put money on the table um, and start to structure an organization within the NIH to deal with the AIDS epidemic. There were a lot of other legislation and, and funding and appropriations and authorizations over, say, the first 12 years or so of, of the epidemic, and only a few of those are here. In addition to the one in 1983, the second most important aspect or most important um, authorization for OAR came in 1993, and that's when they really established and gave to the director of OAR a lot of um, unique powers, including the ability to submit a bypass budget, and actually reinforced and um, codified the ability and the responsibilities of the office to oversee and disseminate the funds as part of um, being, um, uh, responsible for the, the investment by the U.S. government and the, and the public into um, dealing with the AIDS epidemic. So OAR leadership then, over the past 30 years, I've divided um, OAR into version 1.0, which is about the first 15 years, and version 2.0, which is the second 15 years, and have uh, outlined here for you the series of individuals who have led the OAR since its inception. And so Tony Fauci, Bill Paul, Neil Nathanson, up until the beginning of the 21st century, and then Jack Weitzcarver, who had a long, probably, I think he was actually the longest director for 15 years. Over the last year, Bob Isinger um, was the acting director. And so going forward, we now have version 3.0, and I think you can see a phenotypic difference in the current director from the past directors, and it's not restricted to my blonde hair. Um, so we are finally in the version 3.0, and I sort of see that. I put down the dot, dot, dot for my tenure. I will talk more about 
the 15 years that I see as version 3.0 a little bit later. So the scope of the um, activities of OAR really are quite amazing, and I was mentioning to some people when I applied for the position, there was an ad and then a link to a description of the responsibilities and duties of the OAR, which lasted and extended over five pages. Um, very briefly, and only the high points, um, the OAR really has the responsibility for a comprehensive program of research and training that's focused on HIV. It transcends virtually every aspect of clinical medicine and basic science investigation. It involves multiple ICs, institutes and centers. It's definitely transdisciplinary and it's global. And it represents the largest public investment in HIV AIDS research in the world, um, currently three billion a year, three billion in fiscal year, FY16. The overall funding for um, HIV um, since the um, inception of, and the recognition of the AIDS HIV AIDS pandemic um, has been in the area of more than 60, million, 60 billion dollars. And more recently, as you can see, since about 2005, it's been flat at about three billion a year. But it's not an insignificant investment in um, the research enterprise focused at a particular disease. And in fact, it actually exceeds some of the other offices, it exceeds by a large amount of money, a lot of the other offices, and even some of the smaller institutes and centers. The return on that investment has been phenomenal, and basically, HIV AIDS research has transformed biomedical research. From the time in the early 80s till now, we've had amazing investments in infrastructure and in frameworks, things like um, the AIDS repository, reference and re uh, repository program. For those of you that didn't start in the 80s, uh, you probably can't imagine a time when you didn't fill out a form and got a free reagent from the AIDS reference program. But before that, there was no standardization and it was really, really hard for investigators in any field to get reagents from anyone else. Um, but the, and the types of programs that were set up, the CFARS, more recently Chavi ID, the investment in um, infrastructure in terms of core facilities, the non-human primate investment. Um, the, when you think about it and what it's done, just in that particular aspect of what facilitates all of our research, it's been an amazing uh, pivot away from a very much more conservative, one-on-one, -on -one, small type of operation. So as a result, there are emerging research opportunities for HIV AIDS. Most importantly, the compelling new ideas about therapy that are being developed, the new op um, optimism that's being voiced about a research towards a cure, and advances in immunology, genomics, virology, structural biology, all coming together that really raise optimism for a successful vaccine strategy. And I think you, the group here at uh, Duke, are know more about that than anyone else. So the current state then in this period of about 30 years has really changed the HIV AIDS epidemic and the disease from a fatal and much feared disease and converted it to a treatable disorder with a nearly normal life expectancy. But we still have a lot to do. Even in the United States, we have more than 40,000 new cases each year and more than 20 million in newly infected individuals worldwide, and they're still experiencing millions of deaths. Um, millions of deaths each year, even though almost half of the infected individuals are now on antiretroviral therapy worldwide, we still have 17 to 18 million people who do not have um, access or are not receiving antiretroviral treatment. With the nearly normal lifespan that's developed, we now find that there are long-term comorbidities that are related to disease or treatment. And many of these are poorly understood, particularly in the context of HIV. 
We still have no vaccine and no cure, and we have flat funding. So to deal with these challenges, the NIH director um, in 2015 um, put out a public statement about efforts to focus research to end the AIDS pandemic. And what he pointed out um, at that time was that the disease remains a significant public health concern and that the global human and economic costs continue to be staggering and basically were not, are not even sustainable. And so, as you know, there was a public notice then, um, last August in 2015, that I um, itemized and put out for the public the research priorities and guidelines for determining AIDS funding. And I'm, not I'm gonna go through those very briefly because I'm sure you're all very familiar with them. Um, but there are some points that I think are worth talking about a little bit. The way this happened, I think, is really important to understand because in advance of the announcements in 2015, there really was a lot of work that had been done and was at the NIH in order working with advisory council, with different working groups that had been assembled, bringing in different stakeholders. Um, in the trans plan in 2015, which is basically the OAR strategic plan for HIV-related research, really reflected input from the community, the stakeholders, the investigators, the foundations, um, as a follow-up, some of my initial tasks that were suggested that I do was go through a, like a five to 10 page list of um, community organizations and advocates that Francis had worked with and that the working groups had worked with in terms of getting consensus on how to move forward. And I'm supposed to be having meetings individually with all of these people over the next few months. So it's quite a challenge, but it's a really interesting group of, it's not a homogeneous group, but they're really interesting. They're very much interested in the outcomes of the research and making sure, and I think they're very good voices for us as scientists and, and as um, parts of the government to really use and, and um, listen to what these people are saying and have them work on our side dealing with the legislative branch. And then, of course, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion with the NIH leadership at the time and, and the current leadership as well as how to move forward. And so, as you know, it turns out that there are now overarching high priorities and that are focused at reducing the incidence, looking at ne developing next generation therapies, research towards a cure, and looking at the complications, comorbidities, and co-infections. Um, and then areas that cross over this are basic research, health disparities, training, which is considered extremely important, um, social sciences, um, aging, um, and a lot of other of the areas that we didn't actually list um, here. But the high priorities, as you know briefly, are the basic research in HIV transmission, pathogenesis, and immune dysfunction, the research to reduce health disparities in incidence and treatment, and training. And so this gives a little more detail about some of the high priority activities, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and so based on this framework, how is OAR going to move forward in the future? There certainly is, as a result of this um, pivot in focus and, and um, attention on the, AIDS, the priorities for AIDS research, an expanded OAR role in this intense push to prevent new infections and the epidemic, develop a cure, and achieve an AIDS-free uh, generation. OAR will continue to conduct portfolio reviews and funding plans. There will be a reallocation of funds continuing from low priority projects into high priority research. And the resources that are being reallocated to high priority projects um, are, represent um, an estimated, and probably conservatively, about a 10% increase in the extramural portfolio of resources available um, for high priority research. And, the number is approximate because I haven't gotten, I've asked the budget people to give me this information and they're not set up to do that, so I have to wait while they write some software or something. I don't know quite what it's all about. But if you just do a back of the envelope kind of calculation, it's somewhere in the range of about 10% increase, which looking at it from one perspective is a bigger increase 
in resources for high priority research than has been given to most other institutes at the NIH with the new budget. And we anticipate that there will be additional resources reallocated into the high priority projects as we continue to uh, review the um, uh, intramural program and the large portfolio of contracts that are also issued periodically to cover different types of, of resource, you know, uh, different types of investments at the NIH um, for the AIDS, uh, HIV AIDS program. So looking forward then in version 3.0 and really trying to set the stage now for the next 15 years, because what we do now is going to have a huge impact. And if we want to get to where we want to be in 2030, which is an end to the AIDS epidemic, if we look at the um, goals for the UN AIDS, um, then what are we going to do for the next 15 years? We really have to stay on track and coordinate an NIH-wide acceleration from discovery to translation and implementation, and what decide really strategically what are the roadblocks. I think we really need to think globally, and by that I mean globally across the research endeavor, breaking down the barriers within and across agencies, and then also think globally in a more traditional way of global health and, and, and working um, in other countries. But we really have to change the trajectory of the epidemic by discovering approaches to safe, simple, and sustainable strategies for treatment and prevention. And think about what can we apply, what can we learn from the international um, research that go, is going on and apply it to the domestic scenarios. And I think partly because of the year that I, the last year when I was at the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator and working um, with Debbie Burks on um, PEPFAR activities, there's an urgency there that um, I think is really important to translate into everything that we do and not just to the global aspect or the international aspect of our programs. So I think this is what we're talking about is translating the urgency to reach the 90-90-90 UN goals, um, the UN aid goals, by really challenging the research to community to accelerate research and development for the goals that we're trying to achieve and support and provide incentives for developing collaborations and partnerships through novel mechanisms to meet the challenges. The sort of the um, template or the framework for the next 15 years in global health in general and the world economic development in general, as you probably know, are the sustainable development goals that were um, agreed to last year and these replaced the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and in, in contrast, there are now 17, which are sort of mind-boggling how they were able to develop. Um, and then all these different subparts that I'm sure you're probably aware of. Sustainable goal three is good health, and that's the obvious place to focus both domestically and internationally on HIV AIDS. But when you look more carefully at the other SDGs, you find that there are really a number of other SDGs that really impact how we deal with health in general and with HIV AIDS. So no poverty, quality education, gender equality, good jobs and economic growth, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities and partnerships are all relevant to how we're going to deal with this epidemic and get it under control, finally get it under control. This is from UNAIDS, and I'm sure you've seen it before, but I, I like to show it, and, and I was using it even in my research presentations um, before I started at OAR, but it's really important to realize that we only have about a five-year window if we're going to get this epidemic under control with the economic resources that we have. And having 28 million or more new infections is not economically sustainable. And the modeling by economists says that if we don't, what we have to do is be able to get this epidemic down to, by 90%, down to 250,000 new infections a year worldwide if we're going to be able to stay ahead of the curve. And if we don't, the economic, there's not enough money in the world to take care of the growing number of HIV-infected individuals. So there's a huge imperative to get the epidemic under control. 
In addition to OAR, the Office of AIDS Research, and the investment that the U.S. government puts into the NIH for the research and translation of discoveries into health care and care for um, um, different diseases, there's another huge U.S. government investment in HIV AIDS, um, and that's PEPFAR. And so while the OAR and NIH receive about $3 billion a year from um, the government, PEPFAR receives close to six or seven billion a year. So if you look at it in aggregate, that's almost a $10 billion annual investment by the US government in, in a single disease, which is a, uh, an incredible and unprecedented um, focus on a disease. It also, I think, puts a lot of responsibility on us who are receiving the monies to make sure that we're using them as, as wisely and as uh, responsibly as possible. Because as you know, one of, all of this is under a lot of oversight, particularly by Congress. And the OAR, um, in fact, one of my obligations is that I'm supposed to be reporting annually to Congress on how we're using this taxpayer's money. But PEPFAR was actually started only in 2003, so it's a much more recent investment. Um, what really prompted the establishment of PEPFAR um, in the early in the 21st century was really, I think, this agri uh, the availability of testing and being able to do something about HIV infection. This was sort of the post rollout of antiretroviral therapy. Um, the, it's the largest effort for any nation to combat a single disease on the international scale. And the cumulative investment by the U.S. government has probably been more than $70 billion to a number of programs, including bilateral HIV AIDS, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and bilateral tuberculosis programs. The, my, the year I was at PEPFAR, or at, at the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, one of the things that the office that I was directing um, was responsible for were the combination prevention trials, and some of you probably have heard about POPART, which is a partnership with PEPFAR, NIH, CDC, UNA, uh, USAID, and a number of other um, non-governmental agencies to look at um, how to deliver preventive packages to in two countries, Zambia and in South Africa. And the enrollment in these trials is something on the order of 250,000 people, and the, the results are starting to come out. But I think what I wanted to make, the point I wanted to make by showing this slide is this is one of the publicity slides that um, I took a picture of when I was in Zambia revisiting some of the PEPFAR and um, pop art sites in, in Lusaka. And so these are the kind of posters that are up and around. And if you look very carefully down in the lower right, you can see that there's pop art HPTN 071. And then a few weeks ago, I stepped outside of my apartment and I missed the bus, but this was the bus that was going by and I was able to get my camera out. So this is DC with the buses that have the um, uh, posters on them for prep dominate your sex life. And so the, the, to me, this um, combination and the, the sort of harmonization between the posters in Lusaka and the posters on D 16th Street in DC was kind of striking. And I think it really sort of puts together the idea that what we're doing here can benefit what, um, from what other people are doing, and we can benefit what they're doing as well. So it's really a cycle as opposed to a one-way uh, transmission of information. I think one of the amazing things that I saw when I was at the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator is the way PEPFAR leverages its resources. So you think it has so much money, it probably doesn't need that. But what they're trying to do with their flat budget is get twice as many people on antiretroviral therapy with the same amount of money. And so a lot of what PEPFAR does is to leverage their resources by developing partnerships. And this is the most recent one, and I put it up here because I think, again, this is something to to think about in terms of our own challenges in trying to deal with the comorbidities and, um, of long-term HIV infection. So this was just announced in September. 
Um, it was a partnership between PEPFAR and AstraZeneca, and I was actually involved in working on the MOU while I was there at, um, at OGAC. And this is a partnership um, using the PEPFAR clinical sites and frameworks in a partnership with AstraZeneca where they're going to come in and do hypertensive treatment, um, testing of hypertension and do treatment. And so what it's leading to is a much more integrated um, healthcare delivery system where HIV is no longer um, necessarily going to be viewed as a single entity, but as part of um, uh, the testing, the treatment, and, and looking at the whole person. And so this was just a small, when you think about it, it's only $10 million, but it's a joint investment that supports Sustainable Development Goal 3, and it was announced um, just in advance leading up to the General Assembly this fall. And so I think these kinds of partnerships um, can really play a role in, in going forward, particularly if we're going to start considering the, the um, implications of comorbidities with HIV infection.